We've been in a sermon series now for a few weeks called Open Hands. Um, every week I've asked you to hold out your hands and to show me some of the things that we can do with them. Um, we, uh, we can invite with our hands. We can give with our open hands. Uh, we can uh, embrace with our open hands. We can receive with our open hands. Uh, last week we talked about how our open hands protect. I don't, really don't know what the best way for that. I just know it's true. Uh, And uh, this morning, I want us to talk about the way that our open hands should also correct. Um, I think probably uh, the the most, um, at least to me, the the best representation of an open hand correcting uh, is from a TV show that I really don't watch anymore. Um, I actually never really watched it except in reruns, and that is... um, Mark Harmon as Jethro Gibbs in uh, uh, NCIS, uh, the open-handed back-of-the-head slap. Uh, That is, that's the perfect move for a dad to do some correcting. Actually, I could call either of my boys up here this morning and give them both a much-needed little correction and rebuke this morning. No? Not doing it? All right, fine. We'll just save that for later. Uh, Correction is necessary. Um, It is Father's Day, and I I suppose I saved saved correction uh, for a Father's Day message. Uh, You know, that that is one of the jobs that fathers have, is to correct and to rebuke, um, to discipline. Um, It is not something I believe that most dads enjoy, Uh, but it is something that certainly is necessary. If we look at the book of Proverbs, uh, it is filled, literally, over and over again, uh, 31 chapters reminding us uh, about giving correction and also accepting uh, correction, that you are wise if you'll receive correction from somebody else. Um, Solomon urged parents to discipline and correct their children so that their children would not perish. Uh, one of the things that I like to remind my own children of is that uh, back, back in the, um, the good old Old Testament days, that if you were a rebellious child, uh, they would take you to the edge of the city and they would stone you. There was no time out. <laughs> there was no grounding. You were just stoned uh, until you were not rebellious anymore. Um, that seems extreme for us. Uh, Nobody does like correction. Nobody likes uh, rebuke or discipline. None of us want to agree with the truth of the Bible, but we cannot argue with its truth. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I didn't like getting a spanking as a child. I think that's sort of the point. You're not supposed to like that or look forward to it, um, but it does correct us. It changes us. Uh, it helps us to become the men and women that we're supposed to be. Most parents understand that when they provide correction and discipline, they are not being prompted by rage or anger. They are prompted by love and concern. Thoughtful discipline can bring about positive ends, meaningful, righteous lives. Open hands, correct. Uh, Jesus understood uh, the relationship between correction and righteousness, meaningful lives. He told the Sadducees in Mark 12 and Matthew 22... You are in error because you do not know the scriptures. He called them on their mistake. And then he corrected them by giving them God's truth. And the people who heard that that day were astonished both by his teaching and the fact that he had silenced the Sadducees just like that. God's word brings correction. 
in Matthew 18, uh, probably the, the most famous passage uh, that Jesus gives about dealing with others uh, who, are, um, who are followers of God. Uh, he says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Confronting somebody, bringing correction, bringing a rebuke. That seems like a very touchy thing to do, especially in society now that is full of, and I'm sorry to use these names, Karens and Kevins, who are always pointing out somebody else's faults. All the Karens I know are perfectly sweet, wonderful people and would never do that um, un- unrighteously. But um, there is this attitude that, um, that people have that they're just very happy to point out all of your flaws to you immediately, regardless of where you are, what you are doing, and they will broadcast it to every soul on the planet. So it is not very attractive for us to go to somebody and to say, I believe there's something we should discuss. When should we confront another believer? When should we bring correction? And I think the best answer is when the salvation of another is in question. When somebody else's salvation is in question. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 say, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. When should we confront someone? When we see the salvation of another brother or sister in jeopardy. When we see a brother or sister continuing in some kind of pattern of behavior that would call into question their faith in Christ and their commitment to Christ, then, I believe, that's when we should speak up. When should we confront? When somebody's salvation is is in question. Now, why would we ever want to do that? Why would we open ourselves up to rejection, to retaliation? Because we have concerns for our Christian family. Take James uh, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 to heart. There James says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Why? Because we're turning somebody around from a bad direction. We're getting them back on the right path. Now, the danger is that somebody will uh, accuse us of thinking that we're better than everyone else, that we're holier than thou, that we sit up on our high horse. Who do we think we are anyway? But a humble spirit that is surrendered to God and his word will compel us to bring God's truth to other people. We We bring God's word so that people can stay on the right path. They don't get, um, they don't stray away into error. Uh, After looking through lots of things uh, this last week and and doing some thinking on my own, uh, I would like to suggest to you when it is time to bring correction in having a confrontation with somebody, I want to suggest these six steps uh, to make that happen in the best way possible. It isn't easy. It isn't fun. But these six steps will certainly help make things better. Number one, determine your motivation. Determine your motivation. Why is it that you feel like confronting and correcting someone is necessary. 
why do you bring it up? Is it out of a sense of your own pride? Are you going to say something to them in order to humiliate them? Maybe they deserve to be put in their place. They deserve to be taught a lesson and you are just the teacher to bring it. The primary reason, the driving force behind our um, confronting someone should be the spiritual well-being of another believer or the health of the church. If it is not that, if it is not your concern for the salvation uh, of, of another or the health of the church, it may be best for you to stay quiet. Number two, a second step is to consider the nature of who you are confronting. You know, you've answered the question, why do I feel like this is necessary? Second is, this person I'm going to talk to, I need to understand them. Because not everyone is where you are spiritually, right? You may be um, fairly, uh, fairly well spiritually grounded, You've been a believer for a long time. You've been through these kind of things before. But the person that you need to talk to is really new and a little volatile. Maybe there is a better way to handle this. Um, It is possible that as you decide you need to talk to somebody about an issue that you've noticed, something you've observed or heard, you might need to just remember that you've received mercy. You have not gotten what you have deserved. That's what mercy is. So if that's the case, do you really need to bring the pain to somebody else? Proverbs 10, 12 directs us, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers over all offenses. Who is it you're going to confront? How are they? Where are they? You need to answer that question before you move on. Determine your motivation. Consider uh, the nature of the one you're confronting. And third, um, you need to go to that offender first. Go to the offender first. The internet is not the place to register your frustrations or assign blame for your wounds, although it is incredibly popular to do so. Right? We see it every day. If you have a beef with someone, do not air it on social media. Certainly not first, and actually not ever. There's there's no point in that. You need to go to the offender. You don't need to tell your carpool, or your coworkers, or your neighbors, or the hairdresser, or the mechanic, or anybody else. If you've decided that there is an issue that needs to be discussed, if there is a wrong that needs to be made right, the only person you need to talk to is the one who is directly involved. Go directly to the one who has offended you. Number four, use the word as your guide. Use the word as your guide. It is very hard to come alongside somebody, to put your arm around them and say, you know what, bud? Uh, You are getting this wrong. Your behavior or words or attitude or whatever really need attention. It's not because I don't like your behavior. It's because it's not lining up with God's word. You say that you love Jesus You say you're committed to following him. Okay, I'm not perfect, but I'm here to tell you that what I saw does not line up with that speech. It's not about what we think. It's not about our our likes or dislikes. It's about what God's word actually tells us. We correct and encourage, we rebuke with God's word. That's what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, 
correcting and training in righteousness. The righteous living of every believer in Jesus, that is the key. That's the focus. We have brothers and sisters in Jesus. We're all pulling in the same direction. We're all in the same path. We're on the same track. And when we see people leaving that track, we need to use God's word to bring them back to where they need to be. Use the word as our guide. Step number five. Going back to what Jesus says there in Matthew 18, you, take some, you go to somebody directly, you talk to them about what has happened, and if they don't listen, what do you do? Post it on social media. <laughs> nope. No. You take others with you. Now, I think there are a lot of people who have seen this particular step as being um, like police calling for backup. Hey, I'm about to get into this hairy situation. I need somebody to back me up in case it gets ugly. That is not what that's all about. Um, we are not trying to beat somebody else into submission. Um, we, we bring one or two or a few others with us as, first of all, as witnesses to the exchange. Because invariably, two people can have a conversation and walk away from it, describe it to somebody else, and it's two radically different conversations. Well, I thought it went really well. Well, I thought it was really ugly. Well, I, I feel like they really understood me. I have no idea what that clown was trying to tell me. Okay? So you take somebody along as a witness. But also, and I, I think maybe more importantly... When you enlist the help of one or two or three or four others to go along with you into a situation where there's confronting and correction involved, they can say, well, you know, James, I, I appreciate that you want to make this right, but you know, you bear some responsibility for how badly this has gone. You get that, right? No. No. Bringing somebody else along helps everyone to see what the situation is more clearly. Again, if we're dealing with people who, who have committed themselves to Jesus, they're loving and following Christ, then every single one of us in this conflict has God's Holy Spirit. And so we need to work together as followers in Jesus to mend that torn relationship, to repair the breach, to reforge the bond, we need to make sure that our goal is to fix the church, to have a healthy body of Christ. We take others with us. And then last, number six, remember you display Jesus. Remember you display Jesus. Again, we're all moving in the same direction. We want to make it right. We want the body of Christ to be healthy and whole and, and sound. And whatever this issue is, does not exist in a vacuum. Because if you and I are at odds, we've talked to our spouses, we've talked to our kids, we've talked to our boss, we've talked to our whoever, or they, they see that something is wrong with us, and so even if we don't want to talk about it, they drag it out of us. There are a lot of other people who are dialed in to this exchange. There are many other people who are watching how this is going to unfold, and they will be making judgments about you, making judgments about the church, and ultimately about Jesus. How you handle this situation may have long and broad ramifications for people who are watching this confrontation unfold. You display Jesus. Maintain your walk with him. Whatever this is, maybe you need to just write it off. Maybe you just need to walk away, come back to it when tempers have cooled, when everybody is calm 
again. But let's fix, fix what's broken. Now, there are some times when it cannot be fixed. When the, whatever the wound is, it just seems like it's too much. They're just people who are just at absolute loggerheads. They have irreconcilable differences. And in that regard, Paul gives us direction in Romans. As, as far as it is up to you, live at peace with everyone. We want to make things right. We don't like to wield the open hand of correction But when we do, it is with humility, with love and concern for another's walk with Jesus, and we use God's word to bring about that correction. Not our own opinions, not our own experiences, but the unchanging word of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that in the relationships that we have, um, knowing that we get crossways, knowing that we offend and we injure and uh, we insult people many times unintentionally. We ask, Father, that you would, uh, you would help us to make relationships right again. That um, because we love uh, your body, the church, because we love each other, because we understand that we have received much grace and mercy and we want to extend it to others, we ask, Father, that you would drive us to make relationships right and that we would do so not on the basis of our opinion or our, our persuasions, but on the basis of your word. It's what brings life and light and hope and healing. It's the tool that we use. So, Father, we we pray that you would help us to be men and women who love your word, who fill our minds and hearts with it, so that we can engage in everyday relationships with the people around us. Father, thank you for giving us a guide, um, a a pattern uh, for how to deal in broken relationships. We love you very much, and we thank you for dealing with us uh, with great love and grace and mercy. It's in the name of Jesus who has brought that to us that we pray. Amen.